This week on The Watchman, Amir Sarfati is here as we look back at a tumultuous 2023 and look ahead at what the new year will bring. Will Israel finish the job of crushing Hamas? And is a wider war on the horizon against Iran and its proxies? What happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. See how Bible prophecy is set to unfold in 2024, only right here on The Watchman. Welcome to The Watchman. It's now been nearly three months since Hamas invaded southern Israel and massacred some 1,200 people, mostly civilians, while dragging hundreds more into captivity in Gaza. As 2023 comes to a close, the October 7th massacre, the worst terror attack in Israel's history, continues to have massive repercussions throughout the region. Israel ends the year in the middle of a major military campaign to crush Hamas in Gaza once and for all. Now, the Israel Defense Forces have made great gains on that front, eliminating thousands of terrorists and smashing large sections of Hamas's vast underground tunnel network. But there is still much work to be done, and Israeli military leaders say fighting in Gaza could continue for many months. Meanwhile, Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said earlier this week that Israel is engaged in a war against Iran and its proxies, not just in Gaza, but on six additional fronts. Lebanon, Yemen, the West Bank, which we call Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland, as well as Syria, Iraq, and Iran itself. So, was the chaos of 2023 just a precursor to an even more volatile 2024? And could we see a major war in the Middle East that could have global and prophetic implications? Joining us now from Israel to break it down is our good friend Amir Sarfati, president and CEO of Behold Israel and author of the best-selling book, Has the Tribulation Begun? Amir, always great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. First things first, as we break down what just passed in 2023 and look ahead at the new year, what is your sense so far, Amir, of Israel's progress in the stated goal of crushing Hamas once and for all? Well, we're doing that uh, slowly but surely. Uh, we may not uh, satisfy the Israeli uh, public uh, wish to crush Hamas instantly, but I want to remind you that Gaza is the largest terror base on planet Earth, and nowhere and at no time in the history of planet Earth has any military had to operate in conditions like that. This is the most densely populated area on planet Earth, but we have not only upper Gaza, but underground Gaza, and we find out right now that what we thought they have is only 20% of what they really have, and we have uncovered so far 2,000 shafts that lead to terror tunnels, hundreds of tunnels, and those tunnels have many different layers, uh, many different uh, stories. Some of them go 50 to 80 meters under the ground. Some of them are wide and tall enough to have trucks and SUVs driving freely through them. So Israel is now fighting a fight that probably we should have done a long time ago. But it, since the worst has happened already, this is the time to finish the job. We understand that. There's a great resolve among the soldiers and the commanders in the area, in, inside Gaza, but less in the TV studios. Uh, where people are easily criticizing stuff, but uh, they yeah. don't understand what really is going on. Hey, except in this one, my friend, and thank God you are here. No, I know, that's my friend. That's why I'm here, yeah. Of course, we always love having you with your biblical perspective. And you and I were talking off camera, Amir, and it's clear that Hamas 
for the past two decades spent its every waking hour quite literally using those billions of dollars in international aid that flowed into Gaza to build terror tunnels and instruments of murder. Have we seen, it seemed like something was unleashed on October 7th, not only in Gaza, but around the world. Have we seen this level of just pure demonic evil that was unleashed in 2023 at any time before? No, I don't think so. Look, we've seen wars, we've seen military operations before, we fought against Hamas before, we fought against Hezbollah before, we fought against neighboring countries uh, in you know previous years. Never in the history of the modern state of Israel have we seen a level of such demonic activity. I, I cannot even uh, describe a lot of things that I've seen, and I cannot imagine that a human being can actually uh, take satisfaction from stuff like that. I believe, uh, apart from the fact that they were all on, uh, many of them were on drugs, I do believe with all of my heart that we've seen uh, the manifestation of major demonic activity in, in not only, not only uh, among the people uh, of Hamas itself, but all throughout the people of Gaza, which, you know, often people think, you know, there's the Hamas terrorists and there's the innocent people of Gaza. Eric, 75% of the houses we've entered into so far in this military operation in the war had either weapons, rockets, or shafts into terror tunnels. And if, if it's not that, they had materials uh, of how to kill Jews or books that uh, shows you how much they hate Jews. Look, we are shocked to find out that Gaza is Hamas. Hamas is Gaza. It's not that Hamas rules Gaza. Gaza voted Hamas. Gaza uh, harayed and, and, and loved what Hamas did. You could see the footage on October 7th. The, the way they paraded the hostages along the, 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 the streets and the way they thanked Allah for, for that amazing day. You've seen, but even more so, the demonic activity that was unleashed that day was all around the world, and especially in, in Western countries, yeah. where now those type of people that were looking for identity are now finding it in this demonic thing. Amir, you broke down the Gaza situation before the break. As we look ahead at 2024, it seems that a larger war could be looming on the horizon between Israel and Hezbollah to the north. That situation along the Israel-Lebanon border seems just unsustainable. What's your sense on where the Israel-Hezbollah conflict is heading in the new year? Well, it's evident that the, the situation as it is right now cannot continue. Um, not only that we're talking about uh, dozens of rockets and mortar shells, uh, some of the rockets are very heavy, but the Burkan ones have 500 kilogram of explosive material in them. So they are very, you know, powerful. These are being launched daily at Israeli uh, places along the border. Some of the Israeli villages are e either half destroyed or two thirds destroyed. I mean, we're talking about no one can get back there and live there. Uh, what we have is 60 to 80,000 Israelis that live in the north that are now refugees in their own country. They had to evacuate their homes and towns and villages. And there is no doubt that unless we push Hezbollah and take from it its capabilities, um, we won't be able to get them to go back to live where they are. So there is no doubt that there has to be some sort of a military confrontation. I believe that Hezbollah is carefully watching what Israel is doing in Gaza. And if they want Beirut to look like Gaza, and if they want Tripoli or Tyre and Sidon to look like Gaza, then they'll choose war. But if, if they don't, they'll have to somehow um, comply with Resolution 1709 and move up north. But again, even then, Israelis won't be, get back to their homes unless they know that most of the capabilities of Hezbollah are no longer there. So I see that as a not a different war, but a continuation, an escalation of this war. But, you know, prophetically, Eric, there's a different war 
that is coming against Israel, and that's a war of big countries, not yeah. terrorist organizations. So far, we're dealing with, uh, you know, Iranian proxies only. We're talking with uh, the Yemenites, Houthis. We're talking about the uh, the brigades of Hezbollah in Iraq. We're talking about the Iranian proxies in Syria, and of course in Lebanon, West Bank, and Gaza. But the big war that the Bible is talking about is not against proxies of Iran, but it's against Iran and, and Turkey and Russia. And that can only come when these countries feel that they are confident enough to come against us and they are confident enough to know that no one else is coming to help us. So that's not the situation right now. I mean, when you have so many U.S. forces around us, but it is the next thing. And we already see the deterioration in, in, in the Israeli-Turkish relations. And we already see that Russia already took a side here. Yeah, and you're laying out, of course, that war of Gog and Magog, Amir, the, the Ezekiel's war, many have called it, laid out in the book mm -hmm. of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39. And as you said, it seems we are taking a major step closer that Russia-Iran relationship and even Turkey solidifying ties with Russia and Iran. And Amir, as you said, turning viciously, a NATO member nation turning viciously against Israel, but this seems to all be falling into place, right? Yes, absolutely. It's falling into place. Look, I, you know, I'm a torn person ever since October 7th because I want to comfort my people according to Isaiah 40. I want to really comfort my people. But at the same time, I know that something way worse is coming. The good thing, though, is that God is going to fight for us and deliver us, and we're going to have the victory, but it's not going to be a victory of the IDF. It's going to be the victory of the God of Israel in a supernatural way. So I want to tell people, look, you need to believe, because even, even in the bigger war, it's not going to be our own strength. It's going to be God's deliverance. And... Uh, you know, we, we pray for the people, we comfort people, but any Bible scholar knows this is just the appetizer to the biggie, which will come, um, you know, with the Gog from the land of Magog. But even then, Eric, it's not going to end because what's going to happen after will be even worse. Well, we all know that there is going to be a world leader that will rise, the Antichrist. He will have sort of a fake peace with Israel. He will allow them to build a temple, but then halfway through that seven-year uh, uh, treaty, he will break it, and then he, the, the worst persecution in the history of the Jewish people is going to take place, according to Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So, and even then, God is going to deliver them. But again, I'm talking about victories that are coming from God, but a lot of pain and sorrow that is still around the corner. And we need to pray and pray and pray for the Jewish people, for their eyes to be opened, for their hearts to be softened, and for their salvation. And God Almighty, through it all, thankfully is still on the throne. And thankfully, Amen. we've got mm -hmm. Jesus. We've got the Savior of the world. Yes. And Amir, we've mm -hmm. got you for such a time as this on the front lines, reporting on all of it. Thank you so much, my friend. Blessings to you and your family in the new year. Amir, we will see you again soon. God bless, my friend. Thank you again. Folks, the one and only Amir Sarfati. We will see much more of Amir in 2024. Again, on the front lines, a true watchman on the wall. And check him out at Behold Israel. He's got an incredible YouTube channel. He's speaking around the world. And he's also got some exciting things planned in the new year, new year. So be sure to continue to follow Amir. Well, October 7th brings back harsh memories of tragedy, of carnage, of chaos, of widespread destruction. But there were also stories on that fateful day of incredible bravery, of heroism, of miracles happening in real time. And the Israel Defense Forces, the brave soldiers of the IDF, were in the middle of it all. Here's some of the incredible on-the-ground stories that you haven't heard from October 7th. October 7th marked Israel's most tragic day, catching the nation completely off guard. Fear is embedded in 100% of everything that we do as combat soldiers. I don't think that anyone knows that things like that can happen to us. The only thing that remains of them are just dust and ashes. 
Yet as the puzzle unfolds, more and more heroes are stepping into the light. One of these heroes is Major Amri. Being one of the first on the scene, he witnessed the atrocities of October 7th without even knowing what he was getting into. His bravery was key in notifying the Israel Defense Forces about the horrors that were taking place. I would say October 7th caught us in a very quiet place, my home with our three kids. My wife woke me up and told me something weird is going on down south. She showed me a brief video of a white pickup truck packed with eight terrorists driving down the main street of Zderot, which is not so far from here in the Gaza envelope area. My military role as reservists is if there's any attack in Gaza or in the Gaza envelope area to go directly into the Gaza division base and to open our front command in order to enable other special forces into battle. And I went downstairs, put my gear on, and drove down to the south. My entire unit is built out of reserves people. And we met at Ofakim. We got to a police checkpoint, and then he asked us, where are we going? And I told him, listen, we're going to the Gaza division base. We need to open our front command. And he told us, oh, you're going to the Gaza division base. Good luck. On the main road, we saw a car. It was all opened up. Then when we looked inside, we saw two civilians, deceased civilians, dead civilians. And then we saw dozens of bullets holes on that small car. But then further down the road, we saw another car and another car. And then when we got to the rain junction, we saw, uh, I would say, unimaginable or unbelievable sight. Traffic jam with hundreds of cars. A lot of the cars were burned down. A lot of people shot on the road. But then when we look further down on the fields around that road, we saw hundreds of civilians shot. Some of them were screaming still. A lot of them didn't. Most of them were shot in the back while running for their lives. And then we realized what the terrorists did. So they created a fake police checkpoint just to create enough traffic jam and then rode down from both margins of the road and shot everybody inside their cars. And if that was not enough, they went back to that traffic jam and let fire on almost each car in that traffic jam. All of them were civilians. We didn't see any soldiers yet. And then eventually we got to the Gaza division base. Even after 19 years in the IDF, nothing prepared Major Omri for what was waiting at his base. There was a red alert. The base was attacked by mortar shells and rockets. Over 60 terrorists that just attacked the front gate base tried to conquer the Gaza division base. Three to five people held the front gate for 45 minutes, and then we entered the base. We heard a lot of crossfire, and then we joined together with special forces units there just to clear that base. And after we cleared that base, we enabled a lot of more soldiers and combat units into battle. We understood that morning we need to go back to basics to fight terrorists front-faced. The battles along the Gaza border that Saturday were long and hard. They took place in military bases, kibbutzes, cities, beaches, everywhere the terrorists could find people to kill. One of the first sites to encounter a surprise Hamas attack in the early hours was the Zakim training base. In this base, there are mostly young cadets in training with only a few experienced commanders. October 7, uh, Saturday morning, company commander called me and told me there is rockets and missiles to the base, and it's unusual. Meet Omer, another true hero of October 7th. Leaving his wife and children at home, this young man joined the fighting forces in a heartbeat, risking it all. I told him to send the commanders to the front line. I get inside my vehicle and drive to here to fight with my warriors. The terrorists came at a few hours, but then they made the resistance. This is the backside uh, gate. There was a battle in here. Four uh, commanders that fall uh, at this battle. Two terrorists uh, success to uh, get inside the base, and they go to the uh, company. And one soldier, training soldier, only uh, two months at the army, catch the weapon uh, of the terrorist and start to fight with him. And other soldier, also training soldier, uh, shoot the terrorist and kill him. Here, at this point, uh, the company commander shoot to the terrorist and hit three terrorists. At this point, I will uh, show you, they shoot to the terrorists. The sniper was there and he hit 
the company commander, the other commander took him from the guard position to the room, to the Medicare. He get hit from that sniper. The terrorists try to get inside and they, they come to the guard position and throw grenades also. With their friends lying dead beside them, these commanders did not give up hope. They understood the enormity of what was at risk. I'm not afraid to die. I have a family, three kids and a wife. I'm afraid about them. I know that I have to fight with my warriors to save them, to do something. In this brave battle, six commanders and one cadet gave their lives. They saved the lives of 90 new young cadets. Sadly, on the Black Saturday of October 7th, 1,200 Israeli civilians and soldiers met a brutal end. The magnitude of the tragedy is made horribly visible in this place. Right now we're standing in a lot, as you can see, that is filled with different cars. These cars here have bullet piercings through the windshields. These cars have been hit by automatic weaponry, some of them with RPGs. Some of them were also found exploded on the side of the highway. These cars are all Israeli cars. Many of them were with festival goers that tried to break and escape from the festival in their cars as Hamas terrorists broke through and massacred them. In these corridors of burnt cars, different kinds of heroes sift through the wreckage, an unbearable burden. As you can see behind me, Hamas terrorists burn uh, men and women and child alive. I have 14 here that collecting the ashes and bringing to bury, yeah, to bury. And it's a very, very tough uh, mission. In the face of unspeakable terror, the strength and bravery of these men and women shine as a beacon of hope. Their courage and compassion in the darkest of times not only honor the fallen, but also ignite a hopeful path forward for us all. As a father, as a spouse, war is not only in war zones. Terrorists miss us all around us all the time. But I think what we learned as people, as human beings, especially as Israelis, that being united and being together is stronger than ever. And only when we'll be together, we will win this war. Folks, I don't know about you, but that's exactly what I needed to hear. Inspiring, encouraging, God bless the brave forces of the Israel Defense Forces. Keep them in your prayers for such a time as this. They were a light in the incredible demonic darkness of October 7th. And folks, I can't sugarcoat it. 2024 won't be a cakewalk. Here's the good news. Through all the madness, God is in control. He has his hand on his land, Israel. And for every follower of Jesus, he has his hand on you, your family and your life. So take heart and be encouraged. In 2024, let's do what we were called to do as sons and daughters of the King, to be salt and light, to not have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We're ambassadors for Christ. Our voices and example are needed now more than ever. Happy New Year to you and your loved ones. God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace.